After months of speculation, Google has launched the first Android-based phone, T-Mobile's G1. As with Apple's iPhone, you'll only be able to get it on a contract, though this is somewhat cheaper than the iPhone. Availability is going to be USA at first, then UK and Europe in 2009, so it's early days. The G1 is built by HTC and has a 320x480 touchscreen, a hidden QWERTY keyboard, Wi-Fi and an accelerometer. There's also apparently a very lackluster 3 megapixel camera, but its star feature is the integration with Google Mail, Google Calendar, Google Docs and so on. Who'd have guessed? More on the G1 near Christmas, I suspect. The Nokia 5800 Express Music has been launched, a very much Nokia's answer to the iPhone, at least in the mid-range. I expect an even higher spec touchscreen device to come in in early 2009. The 5800 Express Music is still impressive on the specs front though, with S65 edition under the hood, a 3.2 inch 360x640 display, Wi-Fi, 3.2 megapixel camera with Carl Zeiss optics, GPS and the usual accelerometer and proximity sensors. Ostensibly aimed at music lovers, the 5800 has a 3.5mm audio jack, stereo speakers and ships with an 8GB microSD card. Impressively, it comes in at just £215 plus VAT, with no contract or SIM lock. My only concern is the visibility of the resistive touchscreen in daylight, and I'll have this in for review in show 69. With today's incredibly competitive marketplace, with HTC starting to make non-Windows phones, with the Apple iPhone continuing to dominate the news, and with new S60 handsets coming out at the rate of one a month on average, the last thing Microsoft needed was a delay with Windows Mobile 7. This was scheduled for the start of 2009, but it's now apparently been pushed back until the second half of the year. That's a long time to wait. Uh, will Windows Mobile still be relevant outside the enterprise by then? Although I sometimes have to review late prototypes or pre-production hardware on the phone show, this has to be the earliest device I've ever featured. This, labelled N00, is a prototype of the upcoming Nokia N85, and it falls over at the slightest breath of wind, it's that early firmware. I wouldn't normally feature something so obviously unfinished, but there are some unique points of technology that need highlighting here and bearing in mind for the future. Point one, it's got an OLED screen. A first for a smartphone, in OLED, each organic pixel is stimulated to glow for itself rather than the usual LCD approach in which pixels get lit by a separate backlight. The upsides are much, much lower power consumption, a wider viewing angle and glorious screen contrast with blacks in particular being genuinely black rather than just being a, a backlit pseudo black. The downside is that like many other phones I've criticised in the past, uh, HTC, Samsung, I'm looking at you, uh, you can't read the screen in direct sunlight, which is a problem if you're taking uh, photos with the phone, for example. Luckily, the problem is less serious for OLED screens and you only have to tilt the phone 30 degrees or so away from reflecting the sun and you can make out easily what's being shown again. Point two, it's got USB charging, another first for Nokia, even if other manufacturers have had this for a while. Hooray, no more carrying around a separate charger, well, at least in theory. Point three, it's got dual LED flash, just as for its sister devices, the N79 and the N96. It seems that dual LED is the way to go in the industry these days. Despite the advantages of my own personal favorite Xenon, as in the last show, uh, the extra power efficiency of LED and the way in which a dual LED can not only light an evening shot for stills, but also allow some semblance of nighttime video uh, does seem to be having some sort of impact. Much of the Ample software package here will be familiar to most people. It's S60 3rd edition, feature pack 2. And the best way to look at the N85 is as an N95 classic brought bang up to date. As the latter is uh, arguably still the best in the world, this is uh, some viewpoint. But consider it's got everything the N95 classic has, but with far, far better battery life, thanks to the OLED screen, a thinner form factor, better flash, better GPS, extra gadgets, there's an FM transmitter, and USB charging. As with the N79 that I fawned over in the last show, I make no apologies for predicting that the N85 will do very well indeed. In fact, I'm, I'm eyeing up that pre-order page on expenses right now. Hmm. You'll recall from show 63 that I really didn't like the HTC Touch Diamond, particularly hating the screen that you can't see in bright daylight and the horrible UI clutch that is the layered touch flow on top of Windows Mobile. And now we have this, the Touch Pro, 
Ostensibly the replacement for this, the HTC Kaiser or the Titan II, and yet which features much here of the same user interface as the Diamond. The Touch Pro is certainly slimmer than its, than its predecessor in every dimension and has a far superior keyboard. Uh, the Touch Pros is possibly the very best QWERTY keyboard in this class of device that I've ever used. The keys are simply stunningly sculpted and manufactured and there's a dedicated number key and a comms manager shortcut. In fact, general build quality is great with a solid slide despite its severity. I suspect the VGA screen is the same technology as the Diamonds, but I couldn't test its legibility in bright sunlight as the sun hasn't been out this week. Still, the Touch Pro is more aimed at professionals who are, are likely to be doing work indoors or in control conditions rather than out sitting in the sun. In addition to the now standard 3.5G Wi-Fi and GPS, there's now a micro SD card slot. Remember the Diamond was fixed at 4GB, so you can expand the Pro to 32GB in time. Go on then, you're thinking, what have you got to complain about this time? Well, since you asked, although the implementation of touch flow is better here, with fewer instances of screen elements obscuring each other, there are still big inconsistencies here and there, such as tapping on a text field in the Opera web browser in opened mode, uh, and an on-screen keyboard appears. What about the super physical one? And there are many places where the back key just doesn't do anything and the split between its finger-friendly touch flow personality and the stylus-loving Windows Mobile personality is still enough to drive a user to send it to a psychiatrist. The presence of two web browsers, Opera and Pocket Internet Explorer, and two photo gallery applications is still bizarre and messy. Browsing in Opera isn't as friendly as the iPhone Safari. Uh, here's a trivial example from the opening search screen. Double tap the Google logo and you're taken off to a corner of the page. Opera sometimes does the right thing, but it also sometimes doesn't. There's a horrible startup phase for new users too, where they have to sit through 10 minutes of Windows Mobile tech loading. Couldn't they do this at the factory? The camera is still very mediocre, I'm afraid. There's an LED flash this time, but it's weak and in fact calls itself more a flashlight than a flash. And it has to be manually turned on and off. I think it's driven by steam. And you can't control focusing with the three megapixel camera focusing when it wants to and deciding to actually take the shot. Although general performance is goodish, thanks to a whopping 300 megabytes of RAM, there is sometimes a delay when switching orientations, uh, sometimes enough to be annoying. When a call comes in, the screen lights up, as does a big ignore button, which means that if your phone's in a pocket, then this button can get pressed by accident and you lose the call. The built-in speaker on the back is still rubbish, by the way, very, very tinny. I'm sorry to sound a bit negative, the Touch Pro is much better than the Diamond, but the problem is that it's not significantly better than the Kaiser here, uh, its predecessor, and in some ways, the, uh, the tilting keyboard, for example, it's actually less capable. Um, a useful hunk of top technology, let down a little by inconsistent software, this is the HTC Touch Pro. The Apple iPhone continues to impress and depress in equal amounts. Here I'm looking at some of the tremendous accelerometer driven games that are already out in its on-device app store. You see the problem is that Apple has still not got any provision for background applications, i.e. third party app multitasking. And this has been crippling for whole genres of application that are basics on other mobile platforms, while at the same time offering that large and lovely capacitive touchscreen plus accelerometer up for developers to use in standalone foreground applications. The result has been a wealth of games and reference apps, none of which uh, need low level access to the iPhone's OS or to run in the background in real time. More on reference apps in another show. Some of the games are very impressive though, as seen here. Will anyone take the Apple iPhone seriously as a games platform? Maybe. The iPod Touch seen here is a good bet though, with Apple subtly changing its marketing message to promote it as, quote, the funnest iPod ever, unquote. If you're heavily into gaming, then some of the iPhone App Store games may be just what you need to make sure you don't get any work done and to make sure your battery doesn't last more than a few hours. Still impressive though.